Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to Russia in Context. The what Russian Week in Review is gone, and I haven't come up with a title for whatever this news segment is going to be called in the future, so let's just get into it and go over the major news stories that made waves here in Russia from March 5th through the 12th. Now, this isn't so much of a news story as it is just kind of a general fact about modern Russia, but the 8th of March um, was a state holiday, International Women's Day. Interestingly enough, the holiday has its roots in the United States and later in Western Europe, but after female factory workers staged a strike in 1917 on the 23rd of February, which according to the Julian calendar, that's what the date was, which it's now the 8th of March on the Gregorian calendar. Anyway, this effectively began the February Revolution, which together with the October Revolution brought about the fall of the Russian Empire and the rise of the Bolsheviks. One of the first holidays um, the Bolsheviks did was to create International Women's Day, uh, made it an official holiday, and what with it becoming an official communist holiday, it fell out of popularity abroad. Um, I would have liked to make a more in-depth video on the holiday, I'll probably do that next year, but for some it's contentious day in the sense that the initial reason for the holiday, equal rights, equal pay, women's liberation, the like, um, that has all been replaced, basically, by something much more commercial and vapid. Flowers, sweets, uh, empty displays of femininity, that type of stuff. Uh, it's kind of akin to the charges leveled against Christmas in the West. It's an interesting discussion, to be sure, and one that is sure to rile people. But, like I said, I'll dig into that topic a little bit more next year. That ship has already sailed. Uh, as it was, we had a three-day weekend here in Russia, and it was the first one we've had where you could really feel that spring was close. People were out um, en masse in the center of Moscow, and I would imagine in all of the cities across the country, just walking and enjoying the sun, it was beautiful. Something like 800 drones, though, made their way into Russian airspace over the last week, uh, the majority of which were intercepted. Still, it definitely felt like an increase, um, and while the Russian air defenses dealt with most of them, some of them still got through, um, perhaps due to sheer numbers, or it being impossible to build an impenetrable system, no matter what people promise. Those that did get through, they attacked petroleum processing plants, uh, creating impressive infernos and definitely causing some level of harm to the Russian economy, though it's hard to say just how much, as statistics connected to the oil and gas industry have been largely classified for the last two years. However, one statistic that I did see was connected to an attack on a refinery in Nizhgorodskaya Oblast. Um, at that location, over half of all the country's uh, petroleum products are processed. Suffice it to say, any damage to that place is going to have some economic repercussions. There was also a warning from a number of Western governments to their citizens uh, here in Russia regarding a potential terrorist attack over the weekend that they should, you know, avoid gatherings over the long weekend. Now, nothing obviously materialized, but some in the news channels have pointed out the U.S. warned about um, Russia invading Ukraine in February of 2022, but that they were off by about a week. So maybe the same situation again here. We'll see. Reports of malicious Telegram channels flared up around the 6th and 7th of March. Now, Telegram, for those of you unfamiliar, is a messenger service with channels that you can subscribe um, too, and it kind of along with YouTube has become the last refuge of non-state controlled information. Um, these are kind of the last places for anything resembling dissent in the Russian discourse. The channels I mentioned, the malicious ones, they appeared to be gathering up personal data um, and potentially de-anonymizing accounts under the guise of asking people to sign up for election monitoring, which is an activity either done by a political party lowlings or oppositionists who have little to no trust in the honesty of the system here. Now, as to who was collecting the information, no one knows, though there are three suspects, um, and I'm going to list them off in order of likelihood as I see it. So first off is the FSB for obvious reasons. Uh, then there's the opposition itself. They could be gathering information to find out who might support them. Um, and then there are the Ukrainian intelligence services, uh, also possibly trying to flag individuals who they might be able to turn to their side for diversionary activities here within Russia. Speaking of election monitoring and elections in general, there are a few things that I do find absurd to the point of them being laughable about the upcoming elections. 
First of all is just the general hullabaloo regarding as who will get second place in the elections. No one even discusses Putin because why bother? They're already projecting him winning with over 80% of the vote. So in order to drum up interest, they've been trying to sell the battle of the state-approved Lilliputins um, as something worth your time. It's not. The only candidate who actually has a platform that meaningfully differs from that of the Kremlin is Davan Kov uh, for the New People Party. And if he does manage second place, which would be a whole 6 or 7% of the vote, it would just be a dark horse moment as he's young and his party is new to the scene. Um, we can theorize on what that might mean if it happens, but there's no point in doing so now. The government really wants to sell the whole thing as some momentous event, the whole election, um, but all I've seen regarding it is just apathy both on an individual level and out and about among the masses, just in society. Now, the other election news is all of this crying, I've seen it across news channels of, of various Russian ministries and politicians. They've been doing it about how the West, especially the United States, is attempting to interfere in the Russian election. Now, um, it just kind of feels like this childish copycat antics. So, you know, the U.S. pointed their finger at the Kremlin, said, you know, election tampering. Uh, so the Kremlin now feels obligated to return the favor. But honestly, what would even be the point, right? No one in Russia or abroad have any doubts as to what the outcome of the election will be, aside from betting as to what percentage Putin will have for his fifth term. So there's no point in interfering or really of doing anything at all to hinder the process, because honestly, no one abroad and a good many people here within Russia actually believe the results um, are going to not really be honest in the first place, so why bother? Turning to economics, the federal budget has almost hit its projected deficit ceiling um, after just the first two months of the year, but uh, the government explains this, that it's due to many expenses being kind of front-loaded into the financial year. More revenue will come in the following and the coming months from various sources, um, and this will alleviate the situation to a degree. Now, in theory, um, if petroleum prices go up, Russia could even end up with more money in the budget. Um, but if there are any unexpected setbacks, like drone attacks, the deficit could just go over. This isn't a huge problem, right, as the debt is in rubles, but it can ultimately lead to more inflation, which is already on the edge of being bearable. Um, and then we have news stories about airline and agricultural sectors, um, sectors also showing... Um, some surprises rearing their heads. It's just like, for example, the airlines, specifically out of float, are asking for an additional 300 billion rubles to pay for aircraft that they were leasing and then didn't return after sanctions came down. Um, and this is going to keep something like 90 planes, I guess, serviceable. But that money will have to come from the uh, FNB, which is the rainy day fund that the government said was for future generations, but kind of seems like it's just going to be disappear in a few years at the current rate at which it's being used and with regards and with regards to farmers um a lot of them are on the verge of bankruptcy because they just don't have money to buy seeds um i think maybe some equipment but again almost certainly the government is going to have to come in and uh get some sort of payout to them so that so that they don't go bankrupt and so that the farming can actually continue this year. Obviously, this is going to bring up the topic of taxes, and I'm not actually going to talk about this in this video, uh, but that said, it is something that we're going to be talking about very soon because uh, in the last day or two, it has really uh, reared its head in the discussion here. But for now, suffice it to say that the federal budget deficit has kind of reached its limit. It's it's on that edge. Uh, it may or may not go over, uh, but really the worst that will happen would be increased inflation. But again, we'll see. It is only the middle of March. The Russian Central Bank has extended the ban on currency withdrawals until September 9th, uh, at which time it will almost certainly be prolonged again. What this means is that if you have a bank account for dollars or euros, you cannot make withdrawals in those currencies unless the funds on those accounts were put 
put into it um, prior to like late March or early February of 2022. Um, this isn't really uh, any surprise or really just news. It's it's kind of a reminder that it's difficult to purchase foreign currency um, in Russia, really, other than the Chinese yuan. The Moscow Stock Exchange has returned to pre-war levels, which is being used as proof of the sort of stolidness of the Russian economy. Um, and while the Russian economy has certainly performed much better than anyone expected, um, using stock markets as a gauge of a country's economic health is kind of idiocy in my opinion. Um, in reality, it's most likely that other routes of investment have just simply been shut off to many of the biggest financial players in Russia. And so they've taken to buying up local stocks, uh, especially since they're no longer afraid that the government might freeze them out again, uh, which is what happened in the spring of 2022. Fewer and fewer people are taking out mortgages, likely due to the high bank rates and the fact that the government is offering um, a number of incentives for young families and first-time buyers to buy their first house. Um, there was fear in the second half of last year that the real estate market was kind of bubbling, but uh, the increase in the key interest rate to 16% cooled things off a little bit. Uh, at the same time, though, Russia's GDP now relies heavily on construction, uh, which accounts for about a tenth of total GDP. So if people continue to av avoid buying real estate, due to high rates or only buying it through programs heavily subsidized by the Kremlin, it could start to hurt the country's economy in the future. Now, that said, the number of car loans that were taken out last year hit a record high, um, and there's no sign of this trend reversing just yet. So the banks can still make some profit in, in this section of the market, and it will all certainly help out the manufacturing sector a little bit, although they are currently busy with the um, military industrial complex here. One good piece of news is that pensions will be increased by 7.5% in the coming months uh, to match inflation or projected inflation and rising prices. But as I've mentioned before, many pensioners would argue that it's still not enough uh, to cover necessities. Also, the announcement comes in the run-up to the election, and the older end of the spectrum is Putin's strongest bastion of support. So there's definitely some political motivation and, and movements going on here as well. Measles. These outbreaks are happening more and more across Russia. Uh, 16 points have been identified recently in Trinburg. Um, there was another one in the city of Lubertsy in the Moscow region. Just in general, since the beginning of the year, more than half of Russia's regions have reported such outbreaks, with the total number of infected around 1,000. Some medical professionals have also expressed concerns about a lack of vaccines for the easily preventable disease. Now, I will say that this is not a new trend. Over the last few years, but let's be real, especially since COVID, diseases which in the past could easily be taken care of with vaccines have kind of surged back. I know this is not just Russia, it's everywhere, but it seems to be a bigger problem here. Um, now, whether this is due to citizens believing anti-vax narratives or just simply in Russia, a lack of necessary supplies, that I can't explain, um, though I would wager that it's a combination of both factors. One story which has surfaced multiple times over the last month is that Russia finally annulled an agreement that they had with the UK which allowed boats from the British Isles to fish in the Barents Sea. Um, the document was signed during the USSR back in the 1960s, and then it just was never reviewed, um, which I think is kind of interesting because it highlights how much of modern Russia's legislation is just handed down from the Soviet Union blindly, um, and also how little Russia has to economically strike back at those who displeased them. Right, Just like with Ecuador and the bananas, it's food-related, uh, though I will say that this time, the end result might actually be some fish cheaper in the shops. Uh, that is what the Ghost Duma has promised at any rate, but there, I will believe it when I see it. On the heels of Transnistria's anticlimactic announcement last week um, that nevertheless captured the attention of Russia and people concerned with Eastern Europe, another region of Moldova, which borders Ukraine, has stirred up attention here in Russia, and I would imagine to some degree in the West as well. 
Now, this time the focus was on Gagauzia, which is an autonomous region of Moldova with Turkish roots. Now, the leader of Gagauzia, which is Evgenia uh, Wutsul, made a trip to Moscow where she met with Putin and other high-ranking government members. She also announced that the region um, would be working to increase and develop independent economic and diplomatic ties with Russia as a whole and various oblasts individually. Now, why this has ranks concern here um, and abroad is um, that some Russian authorities have stated on more than one occasion that they believe Odessa to be a Russian city um, and that it should be brought back into the Russian fold. Now, this would require the Russian army conquering additional Ukrainian territory. However, if this were to happen, it would see that very same army on the border of Moldova um, in the regions of Transnistria and Gagauzia. And, and as some people theorize, why wouldn't the Russian army just push on a little further and help those poor uh, suffering regions, you know, kind of bringing them Russian liberation? Obviously, make of that, you know, believe what you will about either science intentions here, but at the very least, understand why some are perturbed by these developments. In the same period of time, France announced support for the Moldovan government. Uh, this comes now after France has spent the last month or so expanding ties between itself and Armenia. Uh, as to why France is so interested in these small former Soviet states, it's likely due to that whole, you know, pro-Russian forces in Africa taking power in a number of countries, uh, which has pushed France more out of the continent. So just keep in mind that both sides are playing the neo-colonialism game. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and before anyone shouts that it's not what Russia's doing, we probably shouldn't forget, the, you know, the free grain shipments that were made to African countries, um, which support Russia. Um, and how just this last week, 20 million liters of fuel uh, was given to Mali, which is viewed by Moscow as an ally, completely for free. Both sides engage in the same tactics, uh, and, you know, no matter what some of you might like to believe. I'd also like to point out, um, at least with Armenia, but also likely so with Moldova, the Russian government doesn't really have any recourse if those countries move to distance themselves further. Um, for example, with Armenia, even if it does officially leave the Odekebe, Russia doesn't have much that they can do to punish Armenia, even economically. And if Moldova pushes to resolve the Transnistria uh, and Gagauzia situations to further their steps towards zero integration, again, I just don't see there's much that they can do, and most political experts are in that same boat. How about we wrap up this whole segment with some fun news? Over the long 8th of March weekend, the world's largest berry tort and the world's largest gin and tonic were made here in Russia. The berry tort, which was made in Sochi, measured in at 4 meters by 2.5 meters and weighed over 500 kilograms, while the gin and tonic here in Moscow was over 2,000 liters and housed in a giant cube with ice walls. Now, the pie I get, it's definitely the ideal time of year for that, but if you ask me, it's a bit early for gin and tonics. That's always been more of a summer drink in my book, but I'm sure people had a good time. Sorry about the delay in this video. Um, I do know and I do remember that last time I said I was going to be doing two of these a week, um, but I was one of those people out walking around the center of Moscow over the three-day weekend, just out there enjoying the weather, sun on my face, um, and I was really only reading the news in the evenings and not taking notes, um, or very civil ones. Um, and then since the week started, I've been dealing with a small head cold, which if you listen carefully, you might be able to, to, to notice. That said, I haven't forgotten what I said. I will get into that rhythm, and at the very least, this video did arrive only a week after the last one, which is certainly better than the prior release schedule. Um, in short, all excuses aside, I haven't forgotten or stopped working here. Uh, I just haven't quite found that comfortable schedule yet. I do want to release another one of these videos over the weekend because there are some things I left out here uh, for the last day or two. And with the election starting on Friday, 
there will be plenty to dig into with that. Um, it will almost certainly be shorter, but hey, maybe that's for the best. As it is, we've come to the end of the video. Um, leave a like, leave a comment, um, share the video with friends. That's always nice too. If, if there was something interesting for you here, perhaps others would find it interesting as well. So spread the word. Um, however, you know, this has been Russia in Context. Thanks for watching.